Hey Team BE, thank you for joining us on episode 3 of Team BE Talks. Today we're interviewing Rachel Hamilton of Spirit Strength Collective, where we'll talk more about intuitive eating and how that affects us equestrians. This was a webinar we hosted a few weeks ago, and Rachel has graciously allowed us to post this on our YouTube channel so that we can better serve and reach more of our clients with all of this valuable information. So listen up and learn something new about intuitive eating, about body image for equestrians, and let's keep helping each other help ourselves and help our horses. Here we go. As Britta said, uh, this is very near and dear to my heart, and I'm super excited to be here today. Uh, to do this. So thanks so much um, to Bridget and, and the rest of the Vitality Equine team to, for inviting me. So first, um, this is just an overview of what we're going to talk about today. So first, uh, what is intuitive eating? Um, how is it related to riding? How can you use it to feel better about your body in and out of the saddle? And like, who am I? Who even is this person talking? Why, why should I um, be here today? And what to do? I made up this voice, but I guess I'll start there just so you know a little bit about me. So I'm Rachel Hamilton, as Bridget said. Um, you can find me online at Spirit Strength Collective on Instagram and at my website, www.spirit-strength.com. This is my gelding, Spyro, as uh, Bridget alluded to. He's 19 now, and I've had him since he was uh, four, so we've had quite a journey together. And he's been by my side through all the ups and downs of um, my body image issues and my disordered eating issues, which I'll as I said, on Instagram and spiritstrength.com. And when I was uh, in high school and university, um, I really developed a really toxic relationship with my body. I was always fairly self-conscious, but um, as I got a little bit older into my 20s, I really started to think that my body was wrong and that I needed to do something to change it. And so um, I started dieting a lot. I started um, thinking I was uh, needed to change my, everything about my body all the time. And, and I did lose weight doing that, but I felt that um, my self-esteem was really worse than it had ever been, despite the fact that my body was thinner than it had ever been, because I was so afraid of losing weight. And then I also noticed that all the women around me were really bonding over this shared experience of, of really disliking their body and talking about how, the new diet they were on and how they thought their stomachs were um, terrible and that, you know, they can't believe that they ate that dessert. And that was really the topic of conversation. And um, eventually I discovered powerlifting. And that showed me kind of what my body was for, helped me to rediscover my physical abilities. Um, and that, that was really great for my self-esteem. And I, and I also still saw, though, that, that the women around me were still bonding over this kind of body hatred and fear of eating. And I can't believe I ate that dessert and all these things. And I just thought, it's really sad that we as women are taught that that's how we should talk to each other. And that's what we have to bond over instead of our shared passions, our shared desire to change the world and make the world a better place, our shared entrepreneurial spirit, um, you know, our shared interests. That was way less common to talk about around, around me in the world I was in rather than, um, you know, hey, have you tried this new diet? I lost 10 pounds in 30 days and you should really do it. That was just what we were talking about. And I thought it was really taking away our power as women. And it was really creating a world where we were limited by how much smaller we could make our bodies all the time. So that's why I started my organization. Um, and you can learn more about that mission if you just go to either of those internet homes of mine. So let's get going on the topics today. Um, what really changed my mindset around food was intuitive eating. So I'd like to talk with that, about what that is and so you can learn more about how that might fit into your life. So intuitive eating honors your hunger, fullness, and satisfaction. Each of us is born an intuitive eater. It includes tools relating to food, body image, and exercise. It helps you rebuild your relationship with each of those, and it removes the morality and guilt from food and eating. Um, lots of dieting programs make you feel like you're a failure if you go off track or if you don't eat something that's on the plan or if, you know, you go out for dinner and you eat um, something that you can't track, which happened to me a lot when I was doing um, macro counting, and it, then you feel panicky and you feel like a bad person, like, like a failure. So... Two dietitians, uh, Elise Resch and Evelyn Tribble, they created intuitive eating as an alternative to those sorts of beliefs around, um, around uh, food and eating that cause all that guilt. And um, they've created intuitive eating as an alternative to diet culture. 
Um, and this is an academic definition, but I'll talk a little bit about what diet culture is. So it's a system of knowledge, values, and meaning that supports interpretations of personal health choices as moral character. So this is the um, looking at someone and thinking you know what their health is and then being able to say whether that person is a lazy person because of what they what you perceive their their health to be based on their appearance it elevates thin bodies over bigger bodies and it elevates people that exercise and eat um, a certain type of food more often as um, better people than those who maybe don't exercise as much or perhaps um, don't eat as much as we think of as healthy food which um, also doesn't incorporate any of the mental or emotional or um, social health aspects of health that, uh, that are often really pushed to the side in, um, in our discussions about health. And so diet culture really limits health to what you look like and your appearance and then elevates um, people above one another based on whether or not their appearance is more socially acceptable in our Western society. So you can see how toxic that is because obviously um, not all health choices are accessible to everybody, and even if we ate the same thing every single day and everybody did the same exercise routine every single day, we would all look different. That's just tr the truth of it. Um, and so we just need to realize that our appearance is, is not indicative of our health, and it's also not indicative of who we are as people and um, how much value we have in the world. So intuitive eating is a way to approach food that is counter to this. And so next I'll talk really quickly about the 10 principles of intuitive eating. How's the audio now, Bridget? It's, it's perfect, it's good. Okay, good, okay. Um, before I get too far into this. So, yeah, you're, you're good, you're, you're Okay, right. perfect, awesome, thanks. So, 10 principles. So we have um, rejecting the diet mentality is the first one. That's about um, stepping away from the idea of food as something that's uh, main purpose is to shrink your body. So losing weight um, as your main purpose of eating or not eating, as it were. Honoring your hunger, learning how to get in tune with your hunger signals, get in tune with um, whether you're one out of 10 hungry or 10 out of 10 hungry and how to respond appropriately to those types of signals. Dieting really teaches us to um, suppress those. So if you've ever heard the advice to drink a cup of coffee instead of eating because caffeine is an appetite suppressant, or if you feel like you're hungry, just have a glass of water because you're probably thirsty, those are ways that dieting teaches us that our bodies can't be trusted and we can't listen to the inner signals that we have. Um, and so honoring your hunger is, is a big step towards learning how to re, uh, reintegrate those inner signals into your life. Um, make peace with food. This is about unconditional permission to eat. So if it's after eight o'clock and you've been told that you can't eat in the evening because um, your body's metabolism doesn't work after eight o'clock, which is a lie, firstly, but secondly, um, if you've been told any of those rules about when and why you can and can't eat, this, this step helps us make peace with food and allow all foods because everything has moral, um, equally, equally moral value, which means really no value. Food is neutral on a moral scale, and this helps us get, come to terms with that. Um, challenging the food police, so that's about working against those voices in your head that tell you that you can't eat a certain thing or you shouldn't eat that or you can't have those types of food in the house because you can't trust yourself to eat them all and you're just lazy and undisciplined. It's really changing that negative self-talk and replacing those voices with something more healthy in your own brain. Feeling your fullness has to do with honoring your hunger. It's kind of connected, but to get to feeling your fullness, you have to work through the steps before. There's a reason why they're in this order, even though they are all interrelated. And feeling your fullness is about understanding what it feels like to be one out of 10 full, 10 out of 10 full, 12 out of 10 full. What does that feel like? And, and really um, being in tune with your body as you eat so you can understand when you're full and how often you need to eat in order to be um, to feel that that feeling and what that's like for you because it's going to be different for everybody and some people like to eat big meals less often through the day some people like to graze some people um, like to eat different foods at different times of day because it helps them with their whatever they're doing in the day so that um, that step helps you really tune in with your own body without those external signals. And tied into that is discover the satisfaction factor. So that means that you eat foods that you like, which is kind of hard for us if we've been taught that certain foods that we like are off limits. Um, so really knowing that if you eat what you like, um, you're gonna be more satisfied. You're not gonna be going back to the fridge to graze and eat things you really don't want. Like eat foods that you like, learn to enjoy your food, 
learn to enjoy or learn to know yourself and what you enjoy about your food. Is it the texture, the taste, the flavor? For me, I really like chocolate. Um, and there's just a certain thing about it that, that I can't get from vanilla flavored stuff, you know? And um, I just had to realize that like, even though the diet books told me that I should never eat chocolate, um, I actually had to go through a process where I ate chocolate bars every single day, like one bar a day, until I realized that it was never going to be, um, like, it was always available to me, so then it wasn't as attractive. So discovering the satisfaction factor is, is really um, important. Coping with your emotions without using food. So I want to talk really quick about emotional eating. Um, we say emotional eating is bad, and I just want to think about what that means, because certainly when you're out with your friends eating dinner, um, you know, when we used to be able to go out with our friends and eat dinner, um, there was that was an emotional experience. We were happy, we were joyful, we were interested in each other, um, and that's emotional. So I just want to be clear when we talk about coping with your emotions, it's not that food is not emotional, because we know it is, and we know it's part of celebrations, and that's okay. This is about numbing. So if you're sitting in front of the TV, or you're driving in your car, and you're eating something, and then you put your hand in the bag, and you realize or in the container or whatever, and you realize that there's none left and you don't know how you got there, that's numbing, that's mindlessly eating, and that's trying to use food as a, as a Band-Aid, as a mask. And so intuitive eating teaches us how not to do that anymore. Um, respecting your body. So this is about body image, about knowing that you have an inherent worth and value no matter what your body looks like, no matter what kind of food you eat. Um, because we are also taught by diet culture that um, our bodies are worthless if they're not looking a certain way. Um, and so this helps us reconnect with our inherent worth and value, no matter what our bodies are shaped or sized like. Um, and then exercise, rebuilding your relationship with exercise is really key for lots of people that have a history of dieting. Because for me, at least, when I was in my throes of my disorder eating pattern, um, exercise was about going as hard as I could, as often as I could, and not replenishing after. I needed to feel hungry after I was done exercising. I needed to feel like I was going to pass out, that I was seeing stars that my heart was beating so fast it was going to come out of my chest for as long as possible. That was my definition of a good workout. Um, and so exercise was a punishment. It was a way that I kept my body under control. It was a way that I um, created a routine for myself that didn't allow me to live my life and actually restricted me from living my life because of my exercise routine was so tough. And so um, this is about rediscovering joyful movement and understanding what it's like to actually enjoy moving again, which, which uh, diet culture often takes away from us doing things you like doing uh, to move, whether it's running or biking or riding a horse or doing yoga or um, hiking or whatever it is, discovering activities that actually you enjoy and look forward to. Um, and then honoring your health with gentle nutrition. So nutrition is last because nutrition has really been weaponized by diet culture, um, by the way it's kind of made us think of uh, protein, carbs, and fats as something to be used to control our body instead of something to nourish us. And also, um, it's really uh, taught us that calories are things that we can't have, you know, we have to limit and that sort of thing. Instead of just a unit of energy that we, that we need to live. And so this helps us reincorporate nutrition in a way that's actually nourishing for us. It's the way that teaches us what feels good for the activities we want to do. What gives us more energy if we're going to have a big day of activity? Um, what do we like to have uh, for dinner, when we're winding down at the end of the day, what kind of foods make us sleep well, those sorts of things, as opposed to, you know, I can only have certain numbers of carbs, certain numbers of fats, and certain numbers of protein, and a certain amount of calories each day. So those are the 10 principles, really high level. I could talk about this for a long time. This could be the whole webinar, but um, I think we'll move on now, and if you have any questions, like I say, you can put them in the chat or reach out to me separately after this. So how are intuitive eating and horses connected? I think um, these six blue stickies here are characteristics that I thought of when I, um, when I felt, uh, when I was imagining riders and horsemen that I really, uh, really respect. And they operate um, from these kind of six principles as far as I can see. This is what I observe when I watch them. So trust. Um, Intuitive eating teaches that trusting your body is important, and, and each of us can trust our bodies. And by getting more in touch with those hunger and fullness signals and letting go of those diet culture messages, you can really get back in tune with yourself and trust yourself again around food. And horse, men that I, horse people, men and women that I really uh, admire, really do have that trust. They trust their horse. They trust themselves. They can create a relationship of trust where the horse and them kind of work in harmony together. And so I think that's the principle that intuitive eating and horsemanship have in common. Confidence. 
Confidence is about knowing that what is knowing what is right for you and feeling like you can act on it. And so when you're confident about what you're choosing to eat, because you know yourself and you know that you can listen to your signals and you know that what you eat does not define who you are as a person, you can live your life from that sense of confidence without needing other people's validation of what you're doing and without um, worrying about what other people are thinking about you. And being with horses, of course, we know requires a little bit of confidence because we need to be able to instill confidence in them when they're feeling nervous. We need to know our horse well enough to know that the choices that we're making for them are, um, are uh, the right ones because we've built that relationship of trust. Um, forgiveness, so forgiving your mistakes. If you make a mistake when you're riding, you know, the horse people I really admire just kind of like step back, go back to the walk, start again, breathe. Maybe they get off for the day and start again tomorrow, you know, if it's really going that direction. Um, but they're gentle. They're not getting angry. They're not um, getting demoralizing themselves or, or talking themselves into a spiral where they're like, I'm terrible. I can't do this. I'm stupid that sort of thing, um, being forgiving. And, and intuitive eating is about forgiveness because we have to forgive ourselves for perhaps some things that we learned in the past about what food means and what our bodies are for, um, and then move on to a new way of thinking. And it's a lot of learning and unlearning, as, as Bridget mentioned. It's a lot of um, creating a new paradigm for yourself and making mistakes along the way and just forgiving and knowing that no matter what, you're still inherently worthy and valuable. Um, and then flexibility. So having different approaches to solve a problem. I really think uh, horse people that have um, a lot of tools in their tool belt, as my coach says, um, are able to be more flexible. They can stay calm because they know that, you know, if this doesn't work for this horse, they can try something different. Um, they're open. They're curious. And being flexible with your eating is about being curious about what you like. You know, when you're doing that satisfaction factor exercise, really thinking about what you like and thinking about how to incorporate it into your into your diet in a way that, and I mean diet as in what you eat, not diet as in like a diet, but incorporate it into what you eat um, and try it out and see how it goes. Maybe you try a new fruit and you don't like it. Oh, well, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. You know, try again. I love the look of dragon fruit, but I got to say it like, doesn't really taste like anything. So, oh, well, like I move on, right? So things like that. So flexibility in your, in your approach with your horses, having different approaches that help them get to where they need to be, really key. Um, patience. So being patient with your horses. Um, when they are, uh, when it's super windy outside, my horses are thoroughbred. <laughs> Sometimes we don't get very far in the wind, you know, and you have to be patient and understand that they are in their own place and you're in your own place and we'll just move together through that no matter where you're at that day. Um, so patience is key in intuitive eating because as I said before, you're learning and unlearning. You have to be patient with yourself and know that change takes time. Um, and again, just come back to that inherent worthiness. Intuitive eating is hard. I'm not going to lie, you know, especially if you've really been ingrained in that um, diet mentality for a long time. And so being patient about the learning process is really important. And feel, we always talk about feel, right? Um, and to me, feel means uh, knowing almost before your horse knows what they will need to be successful in that moment. And so if, um, if you're, if you're asking for something, you know exactly when to ask and you know exactly when to take the cue away um, because you and your horse are working together so well and you're, you're living in the moment with them, you're present, right? Um, and being present is really important for intuitive eating as well because of that mindful eating piece that we talked about. Um, feeling your own internal signals and being in tune with them is key because um, it, helps us, it helps us understand what food means to us, how to eat for our own nourishment without thinking about other people. Um, but forgiveness comes into this, too, because feel, feeling your own signals can be really hard to develop, especially because our brains are so busy doing other things. So it's just a principle to keep in mind. And I think all of these six stickies here um, are about freedom. They're about opening up yourself to a new way of thinking. They're about letting go of those reins of control over your body, over your food a little bit more so you can feel better about it and feel more free. So um, I'm seeing some things pop up here. Are there any questions in the chat? I don't see any. Okay, perfect. If there are any, feel free to interrupt me. Um, so if we look at these and then we put them in opposition to the diet culture mindset. So the diet culture mindset tells us that fear, um, fear is key. You got to be scared of gaining weight. Otherwise, if you weren't scared of gaining weight, then you wouldn't need to go on a diet. That's just the truth of it. And they make us fearful 
um, because because they say you know you won't be as confident, you won't be the same, the best version of yourself. All these sorts of language, coded language, is about keeping your body small first and foremost. Um, and fear and horsemanship obviously is tough. Like you know, sometimes you have a little bit of a healthy fear depending on your horse. <laughs> sometimes like in those windy days, I'm just like I'm gonna get off now because I value my life. But on some days, you know, you you need to be that confident, that confident guide for your horse. And, and um, having fear, I think it's pretty obvious that being afraid when you're riding is going to be tough because it's going to translate to the horse. So we don't want them to pick up on our fear, right? Um, impatience. So just as we said, patience is important in intuitive eating. Impatience is the opposite, obviously, of that. And diet culture really loves impatience. When you see 30-day challenges, when you see six weeks to skinny, when you see, um, you know, a 30, 10-day a cleanse or something like that, that's because they want you to think that the results will come fast. And the truth is that the results don't come fast. 95% of diets fail. 95%. And I'm talking diets. I'm talking lifestyle changes. I'm talking cleanses. I'm talking anything that, that says that you're going to be able to change your body in a short amount of time um, and helps you lose weight. 95% of people that, that do that will either regain the weight in the short term or the long term. And I think if there's any other product out there that was a 95% failure rate, we probably wouldn't buy it. But because of the fear and the shame that we'll talk about later that diet culture keeps us in, um, it, really, it really creates that impatience and that um, need to change right now because we're so scared. So, and obviously impatience with your horse, you know, you're not riding the horse you have, as my coach says, and you're not um, able to be in the moment with them and allow them to tell you what they need and then respond appropriately to that to get them through the process. And um, impatience in horse training were, means that we're going to have holes. So I got my horse when he was four. He said he was re they said that he was ready. He didn't say it. He didn't tell me he was ready for a show. But they <laughs> told me when I bought him that he was ready for a show. Uh, and he was not ready for a show. Let me tell you how not ready he was. Um, and that's the holes that were in his training. You know, I was able to do a trial ride and it was it was great. Um, and then I got him home and started doing some some harder stuff. And that was not there. They'd left so many holes in his training. And so impatience makes holes in our training. It makes holes in our in our body image. Um, it's just a band-aid for the process that really needs to happen. That was a lot about impatience. I'll try and be more concise. Um, fourth, diet culture forces us to eat things we don't like. And it forces us to do things we don't want to do. So when we force our horses to... Um, do things that they don't want to do. I mean, we might get it done, but it's probably not going to last long, and they're probably going to resent us for it, and they're probably going to resist it more the next time. And so, force and diet culture is about, you know, if you didn't have that trainer screaming at you, you would never do that exercise. And not because it's hard. We're all able to do hard things. That's the truth. As Glennon Doyle says, we can do hard things. But it's because it doesn't make us feel happy. It just makes us feel like we're responding to an outward force instead of our inner voice. Um, so we know force is negative uh, in that sense as well. And then stiffness. So we get taught about um, stiffness in riding um, in the sense that our instructors are always like, oh, you know, just relax your elbows. That's what I get all the time. Or like go with the movement, um, that sort of thing. And so stiffness is about not being able to go with the flow, literally. Um, diet culture tells us that we need to eat a certain way. If we go out for dinner and there's foods on the menu that are not on the plan, we have to not eat them or freak out about them or look at the menu six hours ahead of time and plan what we're going to have. Then you get to the restaurant and all your friends are having things that look really good. And then you're like, oh, but I can't eat that because this arbitrary piece of paper that I have in front of me says that I can't. You know, and um, if you're working towards a goal, like an athletic pursuit or something, and you need to eat something that will fuel you for your workout the next morning because you need to be running a marathon or something, that's different, but I'm talking about these rules that tell us that if we eat certain things, we're not good enough, and if we don't adhere to these certain rules, we're not valid. So that's stiffness. Negativity, straight up negative self-talk. We know that this is really harmful to our mindset. I'm sure uh, we learned, you guys learned that from the mindset webinar that was a couple weeks ago. Um, negativity doesn't help us in any sense, but diet culture tells us that we need to have these negative voices in our, in our head that say we're not good enough. We're not working hard enough. We're not disciplined enough. You need to change what you're doing because you look terrible. God, can't you imagine what you, would, what you could be like if you could just be like that girl over there? Look how thin she is. That's the negativity that diet culture teaches. Um, it gives us that script. At some point, we learned when we were younger that we had to change our bodies. And so 
um, without diet culture, I don't think we'd have that voice in our head. At least it wouldn't be as, as loud. Um, and then ego is doing things for outward appearance, in my opinion, my definition. Um, so we've seen riders that operate off ego all the time, and they kind of, um, you know, I used to do jumpers when I was younger, hunter jumpers, and uh, at the at the show sometimes you would see people who clearly um, had a really athletic course, but maybe they weren't quite ready for what they were doing, and so the horse was super athletic, got them through the course, but I was just like crossing my fingers that the person would fall off and get crushed in the middle because the horse was just you know, taking over and, and we were lucky that they were able to jump as well as they could. And that's, that's ego to me because you're doing something for the external validation. You're doing something just to say, um, to say that you did it. And this isn't about accomplishing a goal, but it's about accomplishing the goal without the process. Um, and it's about, you know, getting the, sh getting the show ribbon without putting in the work. It's about, um, you know, uh, losing weight so that you can get compliments. And diet culture tells us that those compliments from the outside are the most important thing because it's our image that is the most important thing about us. It's how we look that defines who we are. And that's just not true. We know that's not true. Um, but it teaches us that, you know, weight loss and looking a certain way and having a certain type of body is, is the most important thing that we can strive for. Um, and that's an ego driven pursuit and it's never going to um, fulfill us. We know that people that lose a lot of weight, um, a lot of times they don't lose the insecurities. They don't lose the self-esteem issues despite the fact that their body is smaller. And that's because they've only worked on the outside. Those programs only um, give us outside validation. And you might feel good for a while and then you'll get fearful again of gaining the weight back because if you're getting all these compliments that you looked amazing, that you look amazing now, and I've been through this myself, you know, I had someone who I really loved tell me that I looked great after I lost a lot of weight. And then I just thought, oh crap, what if I gain that weight back? then that person is not going to think that I look great anymore, you know? So that's kind of how diet culture keeps us in fear. And all of this is rooted in shame, being shameful of who you are um, and what you look like naturally, the shape that your body naturally takes, being, ash being ashamed of what you have to offer the world and needing to change it, being ashamed of who you want to be and what you want to do in your life, all those sorts of things. So that's shame. Um, and these are things I think that are detrimental to our relationship with food and our bodies and also uh, our relationship with our horses. So how can you feel better about your body in and out of the saddle by using these principles? It's really great to talk about theoretically, but let's talk about how we can actually apply these tools. So first of all, I want to ask yourself um, a couple questions. I want you to ask yourself a couple questions. Uh, what can your body do? Because what your body can do, we're here in this world to do things. We're, our bodies are instruments, not ornaments, as the organization Beauty Redefined says. Um, we are here to do things, not be looked at. That's not our purpose. So your body gets you up in the morning. It gets you um, into your um, favorite clothes in the day. It lets you walk down the street or move um, wherever you need to go. It lets you look your family and friends in the eye and smile at them. It lets you give them a hug if you're allowed to with COVID, but hopefully sometimes. Um, it lets you do it lets you live your life that's what your body is for it's a tool for living your life not something to be um, abused into a certain size or to be measured and pinched and poked I used to do body checks in the mirror like at least 25 times a day to make sure that my body hadn't changed that was my obsessive kind of thought process was oh god has my stomach gotten bigger oh no has my you know are, do I have a double chin today now I have a double chin all the time oh well you know, so um, what can your body do? So think about that. When you get into that shame spiral of, of not liking how you look, reframe. What can your body do? How does it help you connect with your horse? So what, what I'd recommend is a, a practice that I, I learned from a equine therapist that I worked with in my first workshop that I ran last year. It's called mindful grooming. So next time you're out at the barn, um, if you're able to go out and if you're not able to go out, you can do this in front of the mirror, even brushing your hair or putting on your makeup or doing whatever you're doing. Um, how does it help, how does your body help you connect with your horse or, or yourself in this case? So get out to the barn, get your horse, get your brushes, pick up a brush, feel the, the texture of the brush, feel the texture of the bristles, um, put your hand on your horse's coat, feel the warmth of their skin, feel the difference in the texture between their mane and their tail and their coat and their face. Um, maybe they have some winter hair still on them, feel the difference in that. 
um, pick up the hoof and look at the structures underneath the hoof and the intricacies of that. Really be in the moment, connect with your horse, realize that it's your body. It's your body's functions that are doing that, your eyes that are seeing, your breath that is coming in and out and allowing you to breathe through that process, um, your feet on the ground. That's what your body is for. So practicing mindfulness can be a really great thing to get back into your body because diet culture teaches us to disconnect from our bodies in a lot of ways, to self-objectify. So we look at ourselves as parts to be fixed rather than pieces of a whole that reflect who we are. Um, and then some practices. So if we move, if we start asking ourselves these questions and moving through this, um, we move towards what can be called body acceptance or body neutrality. And there's a reason I didn't put body love on this slide because if we've spent a lot of time really hating or disliking your body, getting to body love is a really big step. It's huge, it's a long process. And so if first we move to body acceptance, you don't have to love your body right away and you never have to really. Um, it's not just like, you know, being a certain shape or size isn't really necessary to be valuable. Loving your body isn't necessary either. Of course, it's a lovely goal to think about, but for some, of the, for some of us, it might never happen, and that's okay. But we can work towards body acceptance. Each of us can work towards body neutrality, which is just our body is what it is. We're here today. It is what it is. Like I said before, you know, ride the horse you have. Work with the body you got. Um, even just having the thought of, oh, my, my pants are kind of tight today. That thought can go one of two ways. You know, it can go, oh, my pants are kind of tight today. I'm terrible and disgusting and I need to go on a diet tomorrow. Or, oh, my pants are kind of tight today. Oh, well, moving on. Like, those are two very different paths and we can really work towards thinking of our bodies in a neutral or accepting way just to get that thought um, away from taking up so much space in our brain so we can move our brain into doing uh, more important and valuable things that really fill, up, fill us up emotionally and don't take us down that shame spiral. And so you can work on doing this through affirmation. So this one I put up here, my body is always worthy of respect. It's a great one to start with. Affirmations, if, if you haven't done them before, they sound kind of woo-woo, but the science really backs up that they do work. Um, and what affirmations is or are, um, are obviously phrases you say out loud to yourself or in your head over and over. And what they actually do in the neuroscience um, way is they rebuild the neural pathways in our brain. We've built pathways. Literally, if you look at a brain structure, there's pathways between thoughts and concepts, different thoughts, different triggers, all of that is actually wired into our brain. And so by changing your thoughts, you can actually change the way your brain works. Um, and that's, that's part of why affirmations work. Because if you have a neural pathway that you've been going down for a long time, such as my pants are really really tight today, I'm disgusting, that's going to be well-worn. And it might not be as extreme for you. That was a one I had for a long time, but you might have something else. My pants are really tight today. I really don't need to, I need to make sure I don't eat too much today. That's another one. So um, as you go through this practice, you're changing the, the connections in your brain and you're actually making those old neural pathways die out and building new ones. You're paving the way to a new way to think about yourself. Um, by actively thinking different thoughts. So you can write these on your mirror in the morning and read them out to yourself as you're getting ready. Um, my mindset coach, one of them, she talks about putting them on your visor in your car. And then when you're at a red light, you can stop, flip down the visor, yell out your affirmation. And then when the light turns green, flip up the, flip up the visor and keep driving. Um, sounds crazy. It does work and it makes you drive a lot more fun. I will tell you that if you're yelling, I am awesome, as you're driving down the street, it's pretty sweet. Um, so think about that, and then um, if you need help with affirmations, I'm always happy to help you do that too, but that's one you can, you can start with. My body is always worthy of respect. And then this one is really key, I think, for us who are in, um, inviting different images into our lives and on our phones a lot or looking at things a lot, um, diversifying your feed. So looking at images like this, when you look at images of women, I just went on Google and looked at uh, body diversity and found these great pictures. So women... Um, have all sorts of different body shapes and each of these women is equally worthy and beautiful and lovely and you um, by looking at different types of bodies it really normalizes what a body is supposed to look like which is there is no way a body is supposed to look um, so each of these women out here love and life you know each of them equally worthy of respect and love and if your body reflects 
the images that you're looking at, you'll be able to normalize your own body and feel more accepting of your own body. And um, if you're in a smaller body, you can look at lots of bigger bodies um, in your feeds because then you understand that people don't all look like you and they might in, um, encounter some different challenges in their life and maybe get rid of some inherent biases you might not have known you had against people in bigger bodies and vice versa. Bigger body people look at smaller body people, realize that, that each body is worthy. You know, each person is worthy no matter what their body looks like. And I think um, something that people often run into here is thinking like, well, I wouldn't want to look like that, you know, whether it's a smaller body or a bigger body, because it's unhealthy. And what I really want to emphasize is that health cannot be known by looking at someone. You can't look at someone and know how long they can run. You can't look at someone and know what their blood pressure is. You can't look at someone and know what their mental health state is, their emotional health. You can't look at them and know how much weight they can lift. None of that is available to us when we look at somebody. And so we just really need to take that off the table. Um, health is not something we can, we can see just by looking at a person. And so um, just realize that, that body size doesn't have anything to do with health. There's a book, a great book called Health at Every Size um, and a great uh, school of thought around this if you wanna know more about that, happy to talk about that too. So I just wanna look at these images, getting back to the slide here, and contrast them with these images. So this is what I, looked, what I found on Google when I looked up equestrian. So all of these women kind of are looking relatively the same. Um, these ladies on the left are very serious and these ladies on the right obviously are having a great time in their sparkling white breeches. But um, I, think, I think you can see that there's way less body diversity in these images than the ones before. And I think riding especially in equestrian um, world especially is really slow to adopt body diversity, even though we know just by looking at our friends and family that there's riders of all shapes and sizes. And it's really sad, I think, that, that, that tax stores often don't carry a very large range of sizes. I wear a size 32 breeches usually, and lots of tax stores don't have that, my size. And I go in there and maybe it is my size, but they're actually sized about, you know, like a 28 or something or a 27 even, it feels like, and I can't even get them like up over my knees. And to me, that just feels really disheartening because it makes me feel like I'm not meant to wear these clothes. I'm not meant to wear the clothes that, of the sport that I've chosen. Um, and that really sucks because it makes me think like, well, if the uniform doesn't fit the player, is the player supposed to play the game? You know? And so I think it's just important for us to acknowledge that our world is really limited in what we see and how we see riders represented. And it's tough to um, think about, um, it's tough to think about how to make a change, but I think we just need to acknowledge but like this image of a very wide range of women because women exist in very wide ranges across the world um, and, they, and these images are very different and just think about why that might be. And so um, lastly, I just wanna talk about what these pictures don't show. So we talked about how you can't see someone's health by looking at them, but you also can't see these characteristics that we talked about that are um, indicative of a good horse person in that picture. You can't see confidence, trust, feel, forgiveness, flexibility, or patience. And maybe all those riders in the, or those, I think they're just models, but maybe they're riders in the last slide um, have all these characteristics. Maybe they do. I'm not saying they don't necessarily because they're in a smaller body. They might be amazing riders. They probably are. But we just can't tell. We just can't tell by looking at them. And I found this, um, I found this picture, which is obviously like a, a, a drawing of a wide range of body sizes and breeches. And it just kind of struck me because um, I wish that I could have found on Google an actual picture of this, but I just couldn't. And it just showed me how, you know, equestrians are represented and how we have so far to go. And I think it's just for us to be aware of and for us to understand that, you know, our sport can sometimes seem inaccessible. And I don't think any of us want people to be um, limited in the way that they can interact with horses. And so um, I'll just leave you with this quote. So horses never tell us we aren't good enough. If anything, they allow us to be enough just as we are. Stephanie Peters said this, she's the one who wrote the article where that, it, that drawing I just uh, showed you came from, and there's a link to it that I'll send out. But horses allow us to be enough just as we are. And I think we can really learn something from that um, in rejecting diet culture and learning how to listen to our bodies again. I think I just want you to remember, even if you take nothing away, if you forget everything about intuitive eating, just know that you are enough, just as you are. You're here, you're worthy, everything about you is perfect, um, and I want you to, to take that forward into your day. So 
that concludes my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Thanks so much for your attention.